All right, I guess I just get started. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, so good to see you all here today. Okay, I'm seeing attendees are in the room. Excellent. Um, well, as people are sort of getting themselves settled, maybe you can put in the chat, introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, my name is Kate Seltzer. I'm really excited to be here with you today. You can put your name where you're signing in from um, and, and just maybe a little bit about yourself. And as you can see at the top, I've pinned a little sticky note that if you are into posting on social media, if you wanna tweet or post about this particular session, uh, these are the hashtags that the conference is using, so you can use those. So I'll give everyone a minute. I'm gonna go into the chat and then we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for putting your information in the chat for those of you just getting in. Maybe you can see people are just starting to introduce themselves in the chat. And in just a minute, I will uh, toggle over to my slides and we'll get started. Ooh, we have some good representation I'm seeing in the chat everywhere from Texas to Turkey. Love it. Not only do we have awesome geographical representation, but lots of different people with different roles, um, which is great to see. Um, hopefully everyone here will get something out of the session. Um, so I'll go ahead and move over to my slides and we will get started. Um, so welcome. Uh, everyone this morning, I'm so excited to be here uh, presenting on translanguaging as social justice, centering bilingual students and working toward equity in schools and classrooms. Um, my name is Kate Seltzer. I am an assistant professor of ESL and bilingual education at Rowan University, which is in New Jersey in the States. Um, there you'll see my email address. Uh, you'll see my Twitter handle uh, in case you're into um, social media and sharing that way. As I said, we have the hashtags for the conference uh, pinned at the top of the chat there. Um, you know, and the concept of translanguaging um, as both theory and practice has really expanded widely over the last few years, right? Which has been amazing to see. It's awesome. There's a whole strand of it now at this conference, which is incredible. Um, but as with any idea that is widely dispersed and gets spread out, it runs the risk of losing some of its more radical political elements, right? Its political nature. And because translanguaging, when it was first theorized in the US context by Ophelia Garcia, um, it was really a disruption of business as usual. 
um, it was this radical centering of emergent bilinguals and, and particularly those racialized emergent bilinguals who have been and continue to be historically marginalized in the US educational system. And it really called into question um, the concepts that were really the backbone of language education, uh, both in the US and abroad. And it challenged educators to change not just their pedagogical approaches, but their very ways of hearing and seeing and understanding bilingual students. Um, so today I'm going to focus on this idea of shifting our understandings about language and about language teaching um, so that we can better perceive our students' gifts and count ourselves as part of this deeply rooted movement um, for equity, for social justice, for all language minoritized students. So just to give you a sense of the broad overview of our day today, um, I'm going to start with an overview of translanguaging and the shifts in perspective and pedagogy that it invites us to take. Um, then I'm going to show you some examples of how this theory and approach to pedagogy uh, can look in action by introducing you to some of the wonderful, amazing, excellent educators who demonstrate how translanguaging can be taken up in the classroom in ways that support and work towards social justice. Then I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do a little bit of action-oriented inquiry. Um, and I'm gonna give you three, you know, quote unquote, invitations, um, ways of extending your understanding of translanguaging um, in ways that you can put to use in your own context. So, you know, as I said before, we have pretty broad representation already in the chat, people in different roles, in different contexts. This will be a time for you to really cater your inquiry to your own um, particular context. And throughout, um, but particularly there will be time at the end of the session today, um, we'll have some time for dialogue. Um, and you can ask me you know, any burning questions that you have about translanguaging. I encourage you to use the chat. I will do my best to keep up with it as we talk, um, but just know that there will be specific times in the presentation for you to um, ask questions. So I want to get started by problematizing or calling into question what is considered to be the problem in schools today, right? And I put problem in, in big air quotes. Um, you know, I think all of us here, we're here for a reason. We can agree that knowing and using more than one language is an asset, right? Bilingualism is an asset. But there is a different deficit-oriented narrative that is still very common in our schools. Right, that numbers of students labeled English language learners, um, but who I'm going to refer to as emergent bilinguals today, um, that that number is rising, right? And um, that that is the problem that has to be solved and met by a series of typically remedial English focused solutions. The belief that lies beneath this focus on rising numbers um, is that more emergent bilinguals are a problem that needs to be solved in US schools. And while I agree that all teachers have to be equipped um, to teach a population of students that they may not have experience with, um, in my own research and in my own teaching, um, I like to offer up a reframe that bi and multilingualism is and has always been the norm, um, and that there is and always has been linguistic expertise and cultural wealth wherever there are emergent bilinguals and that teachers have the exciting opportunity um, to learn more about and leverage students' languaging and ways of knowing in their classrooms. So here are just some statistics that point to the longstanding norm of bimultilingualism in the US and across the world, right? You can see that there are more than 7,000 languages spoken in the world, more than 350 right here in the US. Um, one out of five residents speak a language other than English at home. Um, you see some of the major languages here in the US, right? Speakers of Spanish, Mandarin, and Tagalog are 70% of speakers of LOTS in the US. Importantly, many speakers of languages other than English also speak English, right? We're talking about bilingual people. Um, and yet, normative approaches to language and literacy education in the US um, have and continue to have 
this singular focus on English. So we often think about language diversity as something that is imported to the US from somewhere else, right? Typically through immigration, rather than something that has always been present, right? As a field, as teacher educators, as teachers, um, we have to continue to historicize the United States as a multilingual place, right? The US has always been a polyglot nation containing hundreds of indigenous languages, right? In its first century as a set, uh, settler nation state, the US rose to power as an aggressive expansionist force which colonized indigenous languages and communities in great part through the subjugation of those languages. And harmful normative approaches to English education also have roots in other racist framings of the language practices of indigenous African American, Mexican American, and Puerto Rican communities, often framing them as illiterate, uh, error filled, deficient, and indicative of lower intellectual abilities, right, which have and continue to contribute to harmful perceptions of language minoritized children and children of color. Despite this long-standing monolingual norm in the US, monolingual monocultural ideologies that have undergirded these past settler colonial and racist policies still pervade understandings of language and literacy in schools and communities. For example, families continue to be verbally and physically assaulted for speaking Spanish in parks and public spaces. And Asian Americans are fearful of leaving their homes, going to church and speaking at all, right, since the start of the pandemic. Language and literacy practices and pedagogies anchored in these racist understandings and that uphold English monolingualism as a historical norm in the United States have been responsible for the failure and push out of many racialized bilingual students in the US. This reality, right, everything I've been talking about so far, both here in the US and around the world, um, has led scholars to disrupt dominant understandings of monolingualism that shape K-12 education and school culture, and to instead foreground students' fluid multilingualism as the ubiquitous historical norm. And one way that scholars have done this is through new critical sociolinguistic perspectives on bilingualism. And one of those perspectives that I'm going to be talking about today is translanguaging. So I'm going to be talking about um, first two views on language. The first, which uh, Ophelia Garcia, Ricardo Otegi, and Wallace Reed call an outsider perspective, is one that takes what they call named languages as a starting point when thinking about language. And the other, which they call an insider perspective or a translanguaging perspective, um, takes speakers and their languaging, which doesn't always align with those named language norms, those standard quote unquote language norms, as the starting point for thinking about language and for thinking about educating language minoritized students. And to explain um, these two perspectives, I'm going to start by showing you a short video um, who, that features um, a little kid who I call my favorite kid on the internet. Her name is Samantha. Um, so I'm gonna start with her and then I'm going to frame this conversation about translanguaging through the lens of Samantha. Ahora qué estás haciendo? Bájate de ahí. ¿Qué? 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 Samantha. Look at it, watch my face. Dude. Watch it to the face, get out of there. Okay, then I'll see the face. It's the mirror. No, ¿qué tienes? A ver, ¿qué tienes? Mentirosa. Bájate ahí. No. Bájate. No, I'll watch my face. 
Freddy. Que te baje, te estoy diciendo. No, aguas no más No me estés gritando, Samantha. Aguas no más No me estés gritando. Okay, sorry about that double audio. I didn't realize I needed to uh, mute my mic. Now I know. Um, okay, so you now maybe know why Samantha is my um, favorite kid on the internet. So let's talk about these two perspectives a bit more and relate them to this video that we just saw. Um, so first talking about that external or outsider perspective, named languages are groups of features identified externally by society as English or Arabic or Mandarin or Spanish. And from this external perspective, which thinks about language as these separate bounded systems that exist outside of speakers, we as external viewers, external listeners would identify one of Samantha's named languages as her L1, the other as her L2. Um, we might even say she's a concurrent bilingual who learned English and Spanish at the same time. And as you can see here, um, this view would conceptualize Samantha's named languages as separate, right? As, as boxed off from one another. An internal perspective um, understands language not as boxed off separate systems, but as one complex interrelated repertoire of linguistic features that Samantha assembles to express herself um, and make meaning. So this internal view would understand that Samantha doesn't have different languages, but she's languaging through the use of that full linguistic repertoire, choosing features that make sense for her audience and her context, right? And that help her express herself. And these different perspectives on language itself really matter because they often lead to different perspectives on language minoritized students. So because that external perspective separates students languaging into these bounded named languages, it means that upon entering pre-K, for example, Samantha might be viewed as quote unquote incomplete or unbalanced in her bilingualism. Right? Her teachers might measure her way of languaging against quote unquote standard or native language norms and conclude that Samantha is just code switching, which can bring with it assumptions like, oh, she doesn't know one language well enough to perform academically, right? Or that she only knows a slang version of both languages. And these negative perceptions of her languaging might mean that her schooling experience will focus on remediating her so-called language gaps and getting her to meet quote unquote grade level standards, typically in one language, right, which is English. An internal perspective, on the other hand, would view Samantha's way of languaging as the communicative norm of her home and her community, right? In this view, Samantha languages the way that we all language. Um, by leveraging all of our linguistic resources for meaning making and communication. But because of ideologies about so-called native speakers, so-called standard language, um, this normative way of languaging is marked as different and even deficient for a Latinx Spanish English bilingual like Samantha. An internal translanguaging perspective recognizes and embraces Samantha's way of languaging and invites a version of schooling that would leverage her existing linguistic gifts while adding new features and practices to her repertoire. So translanguaging then refers to both the everyday language practices and ways of communicating among bilingual speakers like Samantha and her caregiver, and to an approach to teaching that is aligned with that norm and aims to leverage Samantha's full linguistic repertoire for her learning. So in the book, The Translanguaging Classroom, which I wrote with Ofelia Garcia and Susana Ibarra Johnson, um, we talk about translanguaging through this metaphor, um, this image of a corriente, right? A, a current in a river or another body of water. And this corriente refers to the diverse fluid language and cultural practices that flow through classrooms 
even when invisible. And we argue that taking up and incorporating a translanguaging perspective in the classroom means bringing that corriente, bringing that current closer to the surface of the water, right, or the classroom, making it visible, making it palpable, and then going with its flows. And here are some of the reasons why in the book we say that it is important to advocate for going with the flow of a translanguaging corriente. And you'll notice that our purposes for taking up translanguaging range from the so-called, the quote unquote academic to the social emotional, right? Translanguaging supports students as they engage with and comprehend complex content and texts. It provides opportunities for students to develop linguistic practices for academic contexts. It makes space for students' bilingualism and bilingual ways of knowing and it supports students' socio-emotional development and bilingual identities. So I wanna give you a second, I've given you a lot of information on sort of the theoretical angle of translanguaging, right? These different perspectives on language, which can lead to different perspectives on students. Um, this idea of a corriente, a current of translanguaging flowing through classrooms. I'd love to give you some time just to get your, your comments out, any questions out. I'm going to check the chat. Maybe you can just put in what you're processing. Um, so let me read here. I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to look uh, someone. You can actually put questions if you have them under the Q&A tab. Uh, you can just put them in the chat too, but in case you want that. So um, someone asked, Elenita asked, how can teachers advocate for translanguaging practices in their classrooms when there's a huge push for incorporating the science of reading? Um, I know that this is a big debate right now. Um, and while literacy, you know, and particularly reading is, is not going to be the focus of today's presentation, I know you're going to see other um, uh, presentations today, namely from my colleague, Laura Shenzi Moreno, who will be speaking later this morning about assessment and particularly reading assessment. So hopefully she'll be able to answer your question, Elenita. Okay, let me see. Loretta says, whereas I love the image and I support translanguaging, there's a problem of communication. I understand Spanish, so I understand what the girl and the father were saying. But if it was Arabic instead of Spanish, I would not have understood completely the message. Absolutely. And part of what I'm going to talk about when I go into the various ways that translanguaging can be um, translated into practice, we're going to talk about, well, what happens when you don't speak students' home languages? Right. What are the ways that we as teachers can put into place um, ways of, of getting tuned into the meaning right, or the message that you're saying? So this video that I showed was purely as an example of what a communicative norm of translanguaging and bilingual dynamic bilingualism would look and sound like in a home. Um, you know, but I think as far as if we were really trying to get at the message of a video, or of a piece of student work, we need other ways, right? Other um, methods of getting to the heart of meaning. Um, Juan says, most of us that speak more than two languages think in meaning, not in language. Translanguaging makes super sense, um, especially when you speak more than two languages, absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely, um, Tuba, right? I don't know Spanish, but the context conveys the message. Um, I could guess what they, would be talking about, right? And I think more often than not, right, we, we, we are very, as humans, very good at making meaning, right? It's one of the things we're best at. And so there is much more flexibility, um, typically, than I think we, we think there is in classrooms regarding language. Okay, let me just go over here. Uh, Gabriela asks, I'm really interested in families and translanguaging. How do you inform this work at home where families are uncomfortable with or unaware of translanguaging? Um, you know, this is something I think about a lot. I know a lot of educators think about a lot. Um, you know, and we have to be clear with families, particularly those that are understandably concerned that their children won't learn English in school, right, if, they, if we take up a translanguaging approach. And so I think, you know, hopefully what professional development like this um, 
you know, more inquiry on your part into translanguaging, you will be able to communicate to parents, here is the approach that we take. Yes, this, this approach means giving students access to all of their language resources at all times, but we will also be focusing, as I'll talk about a little bit later, on language specific learning, right? Getting them to meet goals in English while also drawing on their, the languages they already know as a resource. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, let me go to here and then we'll move on because there will be, I promise, more time to, to talk about this. Um, recommendations to present to administrative teams, so important. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit later about a, a research project that I was both a researcher on and, a, and later the project director of, which was the CUNY City University of New York New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals, um, which was a, a statewide project in New York State. It was Ophelia Garcia's um, uh, research project, a seven-year grant that basically went into dozens of schools across New York State to talk to them about educating emergent bilinguals. And one of the first things that we did was we invited administrators to um, workshops, seminars, getting them on board with the messaging that I'm introducing to you today. Um, and so I think it's integral, uh, Daisy, to, to bring administrators into this because when they walk into classrooms, you want them to know that what you're doing is based in research, is based in uh, best practices, uh, is based in, in, in theory, right? That really supports this practice in schools. Um, and so hopefully you'll get some things here today that maybe you can bring back to administrative teams for those of you who work with administrators um, to start this conversation. Okay, let me just look here. Okay, so let me, um, I'll answer one more of these that came up and then I'll, I'll move forward in my slides and any questions I didn't get to, I will, I will hope, try to get back to later on. Um, Tuba asked, uh, EFL teachers have this nightmare of L1 interference on English acquisition. Yes, I know this is right, like a major, as you say, a nightmare, uh, a mythology around interference. Um, how does translanguaging framework perceive it? So I would say that translanguaging would say there can't possibly be interference because what we have is interaction, right, among our existing language practices, those features of our linguistic repertoire that we already have, and those that are being added, right? Ones that we are are, are adding to our repertoire and putting to use socially. Um, so as far as, um, yeah, I like that Jose just said interaction and enhancement rather than interference, right? Because I think that word interference means that the, the you know, there's this implication that the language practices that speakers already have are a problem, right? are a problem for language acquisition of a new quote unquote named language. But a translanguaging lens would say no, like th those existing language practices are tools, right? They're inroads, they're, they're ways of, of integrating new practices into a repertoire. Um, yeah, Liz, you said, you know, it's a change of mindset for sure. And it is a change to, as I said in the very beginning, this business of usual that has really been the backbone of language education, both in the US and in say EFL education, right? Which this is this idea that, you know, students are a blank slate when it comes to language and they're just not, right? They have a wealth of linguistic knowledge, um, meta-linguistic uh, knowledge that will make it easier for them to bring new features into their repertoire if we say to them that your existing language practices will only help, right? So it is, it's a change in mindset. Okay, thank you all for your engagement thus far. I, I will keep, keep putting the um, uh, questions in the chat. If you don't want them to get lost in the chat, you can always tag them as a Q&A um, so that I can come back to them. Okay, so, now let's move into translanguaging as pedagogy, right? I, I talked about translanguaging as a shift in perspective, as Liz says, a change in mindset. Um, 
But it's also a shift in language pedagogy, right? An approach that moves away from deficit-oriented thinking and really looks to make visible and leverage students' linguistic gifts. So in the book, we, we introduce what we term a translanguaging pedagogy, which we say has three strands. There's the translanguaging stance, which is the ideological system, the set of beliefs that informs our approach to teaching emergent bilinguals. And I'll go through each of these strands in a little more detail. Um, we have the translanguaging design, which is everything from the design of the classroom space to the design of instruction and assessment that aligns with and emerges from a translanguaging stance and leverages the translanguaging corriente. And then we have the translanguaging shifts, which are unplanned moves within a translanguaging design that respond to that corriente and to students' needs, interests, and connections. Right, and you'll notice that the way that we visualize this translanguaging pedagogy in the book is through this braid, right? The, the idea that these three strands are really braided together for this holistic approach to educating emergent bilinguals. The stance, what we believe, informs our design, what we do, um, and our shifts, right? The design meaning the planned moves and the shifts being those unplanned moves. So um, going into these each a little bit more, right? So everyone's stance, of course, is going to be different, but we do have some, you know, what we call some non-negotiables in the book. Um, and they're related to this word that you see running across the arrow uh, on the bottom of this image. And that's the word juntos, which is Spanish for together. So teachers who have a translanguaging stance view students' language practices as intertwined, juntos, and not rigidly separated into an L1 or an L2, a first language or a second language. Um, they view students' families and communities as juntos with the school, working together to develop students' education, right? That reminds me of the question we just had about families. They are partners in this with us. Um, and lastly, they view teachers who take up this kind of a stance, view themselves as co-learners with their students, juntos in the learning process, right? Not sort of in a hierarchy of being the linguistic expert in the room or the only linguistic expert in the room, but as much a learner as their students are. Um, going into design, um, here are just a few examples of what a translanguaging design might look like, right? If we're thinking about the organization of a classroom space, maybe a translanguaging design would include organizing students into groups with different levels of home and new language proficiency. Um, if we're talking about instructional design, maybe it means creating a unit that culminates in a research paper that draws on multilingual sources and centers on a topic relevant to bilingual communities. And then thinking about design of assessment means planning assessments that differentiate between um, students' general linguistic performances, meaning their ability to express themselves, make meaning using all of their available linguistic resources, um, and their language-specific performances or their ability to use only certain linguistic features to perform a task. And lastly, some examples of translanguaging shifts, and I know you all could probably come up with dozens more, but for example, say a teacher notices that her students are having difficulty or misunderstanding something, she might stop what she's doing and encourage them to talk to one another about a new concept, a new, a new vocabulary word, the topic overall, in whatever language they want. Um, or perhaps, you know, maybe a teacher who does not speak students' home languages uses a translation app on her phone that has a microphone feature. And when a student doesn't know a word, the teacher has the student say that word into the phone and, and you know, they communicate that way. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to show you a video of a teacher who does just that. Um, or teachers might shift their instruction to include the kinds of metaphors and stories that are relevant to students and might help them make sense of new content. So just some examples of shifts here. So what I wanna do now, um, you know, now that you have a general sense of what the translanguaging stance 
design and shifts are, I want to show you a video of, of a teacher taking up this pedagogical approach in her very linguistically diverse eighth grade English language arts classroom uh, in Brooklyn, New York. This video um, comes from that research project I was just speaking about during that brief Q&A session um, called the CUNY City University of New York, New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals. Um, we call it CUNY NYSIB project. And uh, you'll have a chance to engage with some resources from that project a little bit later. Um, so as I said, before I took my position at Rowan um, as, a, as an assistant professor, I was a researcher and later the director of this project, um, which really, you know, the broad goal um, was to improve the educational experiences of students labeled English language learners across New York State. So as you watch this video, and Ms. Shireen Chapman Santiago was one of the teachers who worked with this CUNY NYSIB project, I want you to think about these three strands and have them in your mind. Um, where do you see evidence of her stance? How does she translate that stance into her designs and shifts? And how is her approach aligned with movement toward equity and social justice? Um, and so, you know, we'll have a chance maybe in the chat to just talk a little bit about, about what you're seeing. Um, so I'll play that video, but have those things in mind as you're watching. we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, which is one of my favorite books, and I think it's a great book to teach this population of students. And one of my favorite quotes from this book is, uh, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb in his skin and walk around in it. And I think that's what it's all about. I think as a middle school teacher, it's all about empathy. Welcome back to Teaching Bilinguals, even if you're not one. I'm Sarah Vogel, a research assistant with the CUNY New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals. Today, I'm here at Ebbets Field Middle School, an exceptionally diverse school in Brooklyn, New York. On any given day, you can hear students speaking Haitian Creole, English, Spanish, Arabic, and two dialects of Fulani. Ms. Shireen Chapman Santiago is an eighth grade English teacher here. And she truly lives by that philosophy from To Kill a Mockingbird, that you have to know students well in order to teach them. But how can you truly crawl into your student's skin if you don't share their language practices? In this episode, we're gonna find out how she does it. I think the quote really inspires me to dive deep and understand who the student is, and not just, you know, a name on a roster, but who is that person and build a relationship. Let's get into Ms. Chapman Santiago's tips for building relationships with her bilingual students. Tip one, Ms. Chapman Santiago is a keen observer of her students' expressions and behavior. First and foremost, cues, body language. When you give them something and they're just like, they delve into it or they kind of just like look around. So that's, I always look at those things. I think I'm a mother first, right? So I'm very in tune to their emotions because they are teenagers and they're very dramatic. And so when they come in with that face, I'm not going to continue with the lesson. I'll direct the students to do something and I'll pull them out in the hall and have a conversation. If we don't speak the same language, I will pull out my phone, I'll type the question, give it to them, they'll respond. And I've literally had conversations like that and uncovered some really deep and personal things that actually helped me um, deal with the students accordingly. Tip two, when it comes to academics, Ms. Chapman Santiago provides opportunities for students to show what they know using home language practices. That way, she can see their strengths and their challenges. The starting points vary from child to child. So even if you have three kids from Yemen, one may have had like some um, very advanced education, some may not because they're from the rural part. Those that are more proficient have an easier time making the transition from from their language to English, while those maybe with uh, formally interrupted education may need more interventions. I don't know the languages of the room, but I look at their work and I can infer where they are and modify accordingly. If I gave her the prompt in Arabic and she only wrote two lines, then I start wondering, is she proficient in Arabic? And then I'll compare it to her, her counterpart who'll have a full page and then I'm like, hmm, you know, maybe I'll need to give her a little sentence starter or a little bit more background. In the beginning of the year, January, she started out with just two lines. And then what do we see kind of later in the year with your supports? 
she's sort of writing so, more so she's in still Arabic. so she's writing more in Arabic, but um, it's half a page now. And then she's now attempting to write in English. And even though it's two lines, it's a victory for me. But today's entry was awesome. Where is it? It says, I wear my hijab. Um, I don't know with what that's like. With my Islamic clothes. With my Islamic clothes, which makes me glamorous. And I was like, yes, you are glamorous. <laughs> Tip three. Based on her observations, Ms. Chapman Santiago creates scaffolds that draw on students' home language practices. Students who are literate in home languages benefit from translated copies of texts and prompts, like this exit slip. While students complete this assignment, they can talk to a partner using whatever language they'd like to ensure they understand what's being asked of them. In the end, they must answer the question in English so Ms. Chapman can see how they progress on specific language objectives. You know, Google Translate is always open, and then where I can, I have students also help. Um, and I'll send things home to, like, older sisters or mom, you know, parents um, for feedback and it's just right and but it is a challenge I'm not gonna lie it's a lot of work but it's necessary if you want everybody to succeed. To recap, Miss Chapman Santiago uses clues beyond language to help her understand her students. She makes careful inferences from students home language practices even if she doesn't always understand what they say or write. Ms. Chapman Santiago welcomes all kinds of language expression in her class and provides resources in home languages to students who she knows will benefit from them. Ms. Chapman Santiago demonstrates you can teach bilinguals even if you're not one. Join us next time. Okay, let me go back to my slides. Um, So I want to um, just, you know, go over and explicitly align Ms. Chapman Santiago's approach to teaching um, to the translanguaging pedagogy that I introduced. So her stance, which includes her emphasis on building relationships um, with her bilingual students and using their home languages together with English, informs her design, um, which includes giving students opportunities to show what they know in their home languages and English, um, as well as using students' home language performances, right, like looking closely at that student's writing in Arabic to inform the ways that she scaffolds um, um, assignments and provides supports. In these design choices, um, we see Ms. Chapman Santiago's stance. Right. Whether or not she knows her students home languages, which makes me think of the comment that was posed at the beginning um, of the session about like, well, what if we don't, you know, if I, if I didn't understand Spanish, would I have understood that video? Um, you know, we whether or not she understands her students home languages, she knows that they are important for students learning um, and, that, and can provide her with a lot of data. Right. Even if she doesn't exactly understand what these students are saying. And lastly, we see a lot of Ms. Chapman Santiago's shifts, um, which though unplanned, emerge from her stance and work within her flexible design. She talks about reading her students' cues and making changes to her assessments or lessons based on those cues. Um, she talks about having conversations with students about their lives, um, um, you know, using resources like the translanguaging, uh, the translation app on her phone. And again, as we saw, as she looked at that Arabic speaking students writing, she asks questions and makes inferences based on that work, whether or not she understands that language. Um, so, you know, I think overall, we can really see in Ms. Chapman Santiago's teaching, you know, an example of a translanguaging pedagogy, that braided translanguaging pedagogy at work as she leverages her students' languaging for learning. Um, so let me go over, I wanna just go over, I saw some action in the chat that I wanna make sure. Okay, good, I'm so glad that was helpful to see Wendy. Um, yes, Ashley, she has a great multilingual word wall. And I'm going to give you um, uh, an opportunity as one of my invitations later to do some of your own inquiry. Uh, this is only one of five episodes in this web series teaching you know, teaching by bilingual, emerging bilinguals, even if you're not one. So there, there will be an opportunity later to watch more of these episodes if you would like. Um, let me read um, Myrna's comment here. 
Translanguage is an effective tool to scaffold instruction to help students communicate and demonstrate their knowledge. As Dr. Ophelia Garcia stated, it doesn't mean abandoning the academic language of instruction. Um, you know, yes, we have monolingual assessment. Students can use their linguistic repertoire and teachers can model language to expand their content knowledge. It's important not to confuse translanguaging with code switching, absolutely. Um, these spaces can be constructed, creating safe spaces to leverage language repertoire. Um, so well put, um, Myrna, thank you so much. Um, absolutely, right? I, I hope that I, I sort of, you know, drove this home when, when I was talking about that, that little kid, Samantha, you know, which is that what is often uh, perceived as quote unquote code switching Translanguaging would say is just the everyday communicative norm of bilingual homes and communities, right? And how could we possibly switch if we don't have separate systems to switch between, right? If, if we're understanding language through a translanguaging lens, right? If we don't have boxed off name languages in our minds that we switch between, right? Instead, translanguaging would say we are assembling through the use of the myriad language features that we have as part of our repertoire, some of which align with those named languages like English, like Spanish, and others that don't, right? Um, dedication and empathy as a good foundation, 100%. And you know, I ask you to also think about what, how Ms. Chapman Santiago's approach aligned with, you know, movements toward equity and social justice. And I think, you know, you, you, you can't talk about equity and social justice without making your classroom space as accessible um, to every student in the classroom as possible, right? So from that multilingual word wall that Ashley saw to the use of translation apps, to the use of resources, um, to communication with families, her entire approach, right, the, the way that she is putting her translanguaging pedagogy, pedagogy to use is to make sure that her quote unquote English classroom more emphasizes language arts than English, right, which is in and of itself a movement toward equity, right, ensuring that all students are able to access the content, um, are able to make meaning, are able to thrive. Okay. So I'm gonna skip this and go ahead to just show you a few more examples of how different teachers across different contexts teach through translanguaging in ways that align with social justice and equity. Um, and of course, you can keep the comments coming. Um, we will have time to, to go through. We're gonna have a nice chunk of time to do some of this inquiry uh, independently and in breakout rooms. Um, uh, so, so don't worry, this is, this is by far not the end of your, of your commenting. Okay, so I want to talk about um, a teacher who we profile in the book, The Translanguaging Classroom, uh, named Stephanie. And Stephanie is a high school history teacher in New York City um, whose students are located across the spectrum of bilingualism from emergent to more experienced. Um, and Stephanie herself identifies as a monolingual English speaking white woman. And in the book, we talk about how she learned to hear the corriente by being in meaningful relationship with her students and with her bilingual colleagues. So the vignette that I'm going to read you captures a translanguaging shift um, that occurred during a unit that, that Stephanie designed called Environmentalism Then and Now. Um, so in the unit, Stephanie supplemented the standards aligned textbook with bilingual websites, newspapers, podcasts, uh, video clips from documentaries, visual art and poetry to raise students awareness, um, both about environmental issues that disproportionately affect um, uh, Latinx people and the role that Latinx people have played in the environmental movement, but get little attention in the curriculum, um, such as Cesar Chavez, who you can see here on the bottom. The unit's culminating project asks students to create bilingual social action campaigns that promote small ways of making the school and local community more um, uh, sustainable. So in the vignette um, that I am going to read to you, 
a small group of students was discussing the issue of air pollution and its disproportionate impact on Latinx people and communities. They looked at figures like the one you can see here on the map. Um, they looked at public service announcements about high rates of asthma in certain Latinx communities. Um, and they watched clips about activism, such as the uh, People's Climate March. You can see an image of that there. And this part of the classroom conversation demonstrates the corriente and how Stephanie followed and leveraged it for all students learning. Um, so I'll just go ahead and read it here. Eddie shared in English that his brother had really bad asthma and has had to go to the hospital several times. Luis jumped in saying, me too, my brother El in El Salvador. Sensing that Luis was having trouble continuing in English, Stephanie asked him to finish his sentence in Spanish. Luis continued in Spanish, explaining that his brother who still lives in El Salvador worked construction and that the dust from the worksite gave him asthma attacks. Stephanie listened, and when Luis was finished, she asked another student in Luis's group, Mariana, to translate what Luis said. Though Mariana um, understands Spanish, she's told Stephanie that she feels more comfortable speaking English. However, she's a very competent translator, a skill for which, as Stephanie knows, she's often praised by, by her family. So, you know, not only does Stephanie's stance show up in her designs, right, this unit is clearly aligned with students' lives um, and aims to cultivate in them a critical consciousness and awareness of social justice, but in her shifts, which honor all students' contributions and communicate that all of their linguistic and meaning-making resources are welcome in the classroom. Um, okay, I'm going to next talk about Carla, who is a um, another educator who we profile in our book. Carla is a dual language bilingual educator in New Mexico. Um, and unlike Stephanie, Carla identifies as a bilingual um, Latina. She sees her own linguistic and cultural background as aligned with those of her students. And her classroom is situated within a dual language bilingual program um, that strictly separates English and Spanish by day. But even though her program does that, Carla finds ways to integrate a translanguaging pedagogy and make space for that corriente to flow in the classroom. And one way she does this, and I know my colleague who I mentioned before, Laura Ascenzi Moreno, will talk to you more about this today, um, is by assessing her students differently. So in the book, we talk about how assessment, you know, which is often viewed simply as testing, um, has to reflect a social justice orientation. Because so much of students' educational experience is tied to measuring their performances, it's important that what students know and what they can do is authentically represented. So if students are going to be engaged in classroom work and in their own learning, we write in the book that they have to know that teachers see their potential. When we assess our students holistically in ways that enrich rather than stifle their learning, we're engaged in an act of social justice. So Carla is taking this very holistic approach, assessing students, as you can see from this little image here, from a number of levels, um, uh, angles, including her own assessments of their performances, um, their family's assessment of what students know when they talk about content area topics at home, students' peer assessments of one another, and students' self-assessments of their own learning. This reflects Carla's strong translanguaging stance on assessing her students. She knows that assessments, and particularly those that are standardized and aligned with testing, are rooted in monoglossic thinking that separates students' languaging, forcing them to utilize only some elements of their linguistic repertoire to show what they know and can do. Carla knows that students can never turn off one language or another in order to perform on these assessments, right? They're always using all of their linguistic resources at all times, and they need access to all of their linguistic resources at all times to demonstrate their knowledge and their skills. That's why she designs assessment from many angles, as you saw here, and differentiates between what students can do using all their linguistic resources, right, that general linguistic performance, 
and what they can do when using features from only one named language, their language-specific performances. And lastly, her translanguaging shifts include what my colleague Laura Ascenzi Moreno calls responsive adaptations, which are ways of making monolingual assessments um, work for bilingual students. And I know you're going to hear much more about that during Laura's talk later today. OK. So what I want to do now is I want to move into these three invitations um, to, to, to action-oriented inquiry. Um, I'm watching in the chat. I'm seeing your questions. You're so engaged. You have so many ideas. Um, I saw, thank you so much, Liz. You said, I truly want to stand up and cheer, right? I hope all of you are, are feeling that what I believe you all have as a translanguaging stance is being um, validated here this morning. And hopefully what you can do through these three invitations is strengthen that stance, right? Really learn a little bit more about translanguaging um, through these three invitations. So I'm going to go through those right now, and then you're going to be put into breakout rooms so that you can first engage independently with these resources and then talk about it with a smaller group. So here are your three options. The first option is reading a overview of translanguaging um, in this very easy to read Q&A format, um, which was written by Ophelia Garcia and serves as the introduction to a free guide that is available on the CUNY NICIB website called um, Translanguaging a CUNY NICIB Guide for Educators. This was the first text that was ever produced on translanguaging in practice. And it features lots and lots of easy to um, implement strategies. So if you choose this option, you would read um, a five page Q&A introduction to what translanguaging is, what it isn't, what it looks like. Um, and you can also, of course, look through the guide itself, right? Take a look at the table of contents, um, see if any strategies uh, um, stand out to you and maybe you want to read about those. The second option, as I mentioned before, is watching any of the episodes from the web series Teaching Bilinguals, even if you're not one. Um, you might have time to watch two or three, right? They're, they're very brief. They're about five minutes in length. They're wonderful. If you are feeling like you want to do a little bit of self-reflection, a little bit of thinking about your own practice, um, you can do that by reflecting on your own translanguaging pedagogy using a tool from our book, The Translanguaging Classroom. Um, and I am going to preview those handouts in a minute, but they're, they're, the first two are links, uh, website links, and the third is a uh, handout that you can download and use. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pick one of these action-oriented inquiries to do on your own. And then you are going to come back into your breakout room and discuss what you learned, what you're thinking about uh, with a smaller group. Um, so, okay, so let me first do this. I wanna preview the activity. So this is the reflection activity, reflecting and planning for a translanguaging pedagogy. This is the translanguaging guide and you will scroll to the, oh, this is the table of contents. And this is the part that you would start reading, which is the, oops, theorizing translanguaging for educators. And then this is the, um, I'll share the teaching bilinguals, even if you're not one. So I'm gonna, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but I'm going to share all of these. Hopefully you now have access. Okay, it wasn't displaying when I was doing that. Okay, make sure you can check and see under handouts. You should now have access to something called handout one, translanguaging guide, and teaching bilinguals even if you're not one. Let me make sure. Maybe I'll try to pin them. Let's see what that does. I don't know what that does. 
Okay. Yes, they're all there. Okay. Thank you so much, Julia. That's great. Good. Works now. Awesome. So um, let me unpin this. Let me go back to my slides. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to put you in breakout rooms. Let's see. Let's reassign. 10 rooms. Okay, good. And these are nice and small. So this is perfect. So what I'm going to do, I would say take, it's 1130 on the dot, which makes timing nice and easy. Um, but we are going to take about 15 minutes to engage with your invitation, one, two, or three, and then another 15 minutes or so to discuss. So we'll plan on coming back to the main room at around, uh, in about 30 minutes, um, but take the first 15 to, I realize now that I'm on Eastern time, so it's 1030 for a lot of you. Um, take 15 minutes to engage with the resource on your own, and then in 15 minutes, come back to your breakout room, say hello to each other, introduce each other, and talk a little bit about what you, what you did. Okay, so I'm gonna start the breakout rooms. Before I do that, let me check the chat really quick. Okay, good, everything is available. Good, good, good. Okay, I am going to start. All right, hopefully we're all making our way back in. As you can see, I have moved to the mountains the beautiful sunset behind me. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, good. I see Ashley thanking her breakout room. That's great. I hope you had good conversations. Um, yes, Tuba, I love that as a book cover, right? Um, awesome discussion. I'm so glad. Breakout room five, crushing it. Well done. Awesome, great, Liz, so, got, so glad it was good in your group too. Room ocho, well done. So, oh no, Sulema, you got kicked out. I hope you made your way back in or at least were able to do some, some independent inquiry and maybe you'll be able to pose some of any questions that you didn't get to pose to your group to all of us here in the main room. Um, so welcome back. I, I really hope you got something out of both some independent inquiry into any of these three invitations and some conversation with, with a smaller group. Uh, we're a lot of us here, so it's kind of nice to, to zoom in. You will have one more opportunity um, to have a breakout room conversation in, in a bit more of a reflective kind of um setting to think about uh, what, what you learned and to reflect on the session as a whole. Um, but what I want to do is I just want to move um, into some practical takeaways, um, some things I think are good jumping off points um, for taking this work and moving it forward. And I think some of these you are going to be hearing more about today uh, if you're following this translanguaging strand uh, at this conference. So, so let me move forward. So as I said, you know, the, the recommendations that I'm going to give often come, someone asked in one of the, the Q&As, um, you know, what are some of the common questions that I get you know, from schools, from administrators, from teachers about translanguaging. And often one of the biggest questions is like, well, what, what are some of our first steps? Like, how can we do this? What are small ways of, of making change? Um, and so I wanted to give you a few of those here. Um, so I'll start, you know, with the idea that references the picture uh, that you'll see here on your screen that says, welcome to our school. Um, you know, first, I think if we if we want to normalize, if we want to uplift the multilingualism of a school community, we have to create a multilingual ecology um, in the overall school environment. And this means making sure that all parts of the environment, from the art on the walls to the signage in the building, right? This was a, a welcome sign in one of the schools that was part of the CUNY NICID project. Um, 
you know, to the school announcements that go over the loudspeakers. All of those should reflect the language practices of the students and their families in the school. Um, so this means first, of course, you have to find out what languages are actually present in the school community. Um, I can't tell you how many schools I've worked with that don't even know just how many and which language backgrounds are represented by the school environment. So how can you make a responsive multilingual ecology if you don't know that first? So finding that out through any number of ways and then drawing on those students, their families and the larger community as resources for bringing those languages into the building. And on that CUNY NYSEB website that some of you probably looked at during the, the inquiry, you'll see that there are actually resources for developing a multilingual ecology, which I think is a wonderful place to start. And if it's not the whole school, maybe it's just your classroom at first, right? And then that can grow um, uh, into the whole building. Moving into the second bullet point, um, next we have to, de to design culturally, racially, and linguistically affirming instruction that leverages students' translanguaging practices, their everyday community language practices. Remember that language can't be divorced from speakers, right? You're not teaching a language, you're teaching speakers, right? You're teaching language users. Um, so classroom curricula, classroom pedagogy rooted in equity, cultural affirmation and social justice has to disrupt harmful ideologies that portray bilingual students, particularly bilingual students of color through the lens of deficiency. Classrooms can do this by engaging texts by and about multilingual people of color and carefully designing curricula that both leverages students translanguaging and attends to the role of power, colonialism and racialization throughout society, right? And here you'll see some examples of literature. I included two young adult novels, one middle grade, one, one more high school, The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo and Inside Out and Back Again. Um, and both of these books not only are um, narratives about bilingual young people grappling with the many, um, the many different ideas, right, that, that they're exposed to in school and beyond around language, around culture, they also take up translanguaging in the text themselves. So these are not just great for content, they're great mentor texts for students to start thinking about translanguaging, not as just something they do in their home and community, but something that can be done in published literature, right? Something that can be done in their own future lives as scholars, as academics. Um, and the other two, uh, the three, uh, uh, covers I show, one of which some of you probably engaged with just now, which is the Translanguaging Guide, and the other are two free guides that are available on the CUNY NYSEB website. Um, the ones that are featured here are uh, about curriculum and instruction and one about writing, but we have many guides, all for free, um, that just offer accessible ways of using translanguaging as a lens on curriculum and instruction. My last recommendation has to do with providing teachers and other school professionals with professional development that engages their translanguaging stances, right? PD like this, right? That this entire strand devoted to engaging with these ideas. Um, so this means shifting the emphasis of professional development from strategies, right? Which, I mean, we've all been a part of, of PD that you know, really attends to just things you can do, but not necessarily ways that we think. And so, you know, I think at least we have to focus concurrently on the two practices and ideologies and mindsets and stance. So this can be done in a lot of ways. Um, I've seen this done really beautifully uh, through the creation of professional learning communities um, committed to developing a translanguaging stance and translating that stance into classroom practice. Um, I've seen it done through the creation of leadership teams, local leadership teams focused specifically on teaching emergent bilinguals, um, or through action-oriented study groups or book groups around texts, um, like our book, you see the cover there, The Translanguaging Classroom. If you get that book, you also get a study guide that can be used with a group of teachers to really deeply engage with the ideas. Um, or you can find any number of Ophelia Garcia's talks on translanguaging um, that really delve into translanguaging theory and practice. 
So, you know, to, to close out my big piece of this talk, because in a moment we're going to move into some reflection and some future oriented thinking. I want to come back to this idea that there is a quote unquote problem with the education of emergent bilinguals in the US. Um, I actually very much agree. <laughs> I think there is indeed a problem, but it's not the rising number of students labeled English language learners in schools. The real problem is the singular emphasis on English or on the separation of students' languages. We do this under the guise of teaching emergent bilingual so-called academic language and literacy skills that they need um, to succeed in school, but it actually silences them and obscures the linguistic gifts um, that they already have, right? That they already bring with them. So to address this problem, this very real problem, I hope that what today's session offered um, was a chance to learn more about translanguaging um, and how it can be used as a framework for educating these students in more equitable, humanizing, socially just ways. Um, I hope that I've connected ways of teaching through a translanguaging lens to a broader mission of social justice that so many of us, I believe, take um, in our classroom teaching. So what I would like to do um, is give you a little bit of time to engage with some reflection, as I said, um, to, to actually engage in a little bit of dreaming where we want to go next with this. So what we're going to do is, again, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, give you some time to do a little bit of independent reflection. And then hopefully, just as you had great conversations in these first breakout rooms, you'll have another round of reflective talk in a breakout room with some like-minded thinkers about some, using this um, handout. And if you go into the handouts tab, this one is here as well. It's called What, So What, Now What? And so basically the, the first part, the what, is you know what was the point of this workshop? What issues were addressed? If someone asked you, what did you do for a couple of hours on Tuesday morning, what would you say, right? What is the what? Um, the second column, the so what, um, the second part that you'll reflect on is what did you learn? And why do the issues that were brought up in this workshop matter? Um, here's where you're really reflecting on, you know, your learning through the session, not just what it was, but what you learned. Um, and lastly, you'll reflect and do some dreaming by thinking about now what, um, how you want to think or act in the future as a result of what you learned today. Um, what do you still want to learn more about? This might be a place to come up with some questions because I'm going to have some time for Q&A at the end after your reflective time. Um, I would suggest first taking some time to reflect personally, right? Um, maybe fill out or think about the what, so what, and now what on your own. And then maybe each person in the breakout room can share their thoughts on each of these three columns. Um, so as I did before, I'll be trying to bounce around through the breakout rooms as much as I can. There are 10 breakout rooms, so it's not always possible to, for me to spend lots of time in each one, but I'll try my best to hit the groups I didn't make the first round. Um, and we'll take a little bit of time to do this, um, probably a little less time than in the first round of breakout rooms. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'm gonna start the breakout rooms again. Make sure you have access to that handout. It's handout number two. It's called So What, What, So What, Now What. Okay. All right. Okay. Hopefully we are coming back now. Um, I hope you had as good conversations, if not a, you know, a little short in your breakout rooms this time as you did it, as the first time. Talked a little bit about what mattered from this session. Um, and you know, I think important to focus on that last column of now what, right? As I said before, that's that's sort of the dreaming piece, right? The, the part where you think, what do I want to 
do? What do I want to see? What do I want to, to try? Um, and that's an exciting space. I think particularly uh, here in the US uh, at the end of, of an academic year, right? To think about, okay, how do I want to hit the ground running differently um, or enhance something I did this year that really worked uh, first thing next year? Um, so glad to hear, okay, um, Las Chicas del Ocho, I love it. Glad you had a great conversation in, in room eight. Um, room five, interesting points of view from different sectors. Wonderful, that's great. Um, so, so what I wanna do um, as sort of a, a final opportunity to talk is I do want to sort of open up the floor, reopen, maybe revisit the Q&A if, if some questions didn't get answered, give you an opportunity now that we've had two hours plus together to, to reflect on, you know, you can offer not just a question, but a, but a reflection maybe something you want to share, part of your now what that you're gonna be doing or, or hope to do, um, questions that you now have that you wouldn't have even known to ask before. Uh, anything you would like, you can put in the chat, um, mark it as a Q&A if you, if you want, um, so it doesn't get lost. Um, but I would love to hear any thoughts that you have, any remaining thoughts that you have. And I'll revisit the Q&A now while you're thinking. I'm seeing in the Q&A a lot of questions that relate to assessment, um, you know, which, which in many ways is such a, a frontier, right, for, for this translanguaging work. Because, you know, so much of what I hear in schools is, I really like this translanguaging approach, but they have to take a test in English at the end of the year, right, or, or for what, or whatever assessment they're preparing for. And I get that, right? I really get that tension. Um, and even though we talk a lot about how to walk that line, right? How to prepare students for an exam in one named language through a translanguaging approach, I do think, you know, movement toward assessments that really draw on students' translanguaging is a major uh, movement, right? And I know Laura, um, my colleague Laura Shenzi Moreno, who you're going to hear from hopefully um, next, you'll, you'll stick around and hear her session, um, is about assessment in particular. And she has some really brilliant thinking around a translanguaging lens on assessment. Go back to the chat. Mm. Uh, Diana asked, how do you incorporate a space for translanguaging in curriculum? Um, such a great question. And obviously, uh, you know, different educators have different parameters, different constraints, different opportunities when it comes to curriculum. Um, you know, for those of us who have some freedom with curriculum, I would say the integration of texts, like some of the ones that I featured, um, that, that feature not only bilingual characters, but also bilingual language practices, translingual practices in the books themselves, and really organizing students' inquiry and reading of that book around language, around culture. Um, so, so these kinds of mentor texts make wonderful classroom texts. That's a way to integrate this into curriculum. Um, I gave an example of a design, right, doing writing assignments that engage students in all sorts of, of um, translanguaging, not only in process, right, which is maybe pre-writing in any language in preparation for a piece of writing in one named language only. Um, peer, uh, peer editing, where students can use any kind of language practices they want to give each other feedback. Um, drafting in one language in preparation for writing in another, right? All of these are sort of general ways of bringing a translanguaging lens into a writing curriculum. But also the product itself can be translanguaged, right? What if students were, you know, um, writing narrative essays and part of their dialogue was between bilingual people, right? A memory of theirs with a, with a bilingual parent. Maybe the dialogue that they're writing would not be in English or in another language only, right? So these are ways of just integrating 
a more expansive view of language into the curriculum. That's if you have some freedom. Even if you don't, right, if your school is using a scripted curriculum, if you have very strong constraints on, on what you're teaching, I think there are ways to supplement. I think there are ways to do small things that get students talking. Um, I think there are ways to um, highlight elements of the curriculum that aren't emphasized necessarily in the curriculum itself, but that might be relevant to students' lives, to their backgrounds. Um, you know, I, I have a, a colleague, Carla Espana, who does a lot of work with curriculum, who talks about doing multilingual, multimodal text sets, right? So if you are teaching, a, say, the, you know, Lucy Calkins, um reading and writing, uh, New York City, um, New York City, what am I talking about? The reading and writing project, the teacher's college, that's what I meant, reading and writing project starting a unit with a multilingual multimodal text set that introduces the topic that previews the ideas set out in the whole class text that that gives students an entry point through different languages and different modalities you're still working within the constraints of a scripted curriculum but you have access and you are expanding that curriculum um oh thank you liz for for including carla's um uh perfect um um, her website there and you can follow her on Twitter. She has, she and her colleague, uh, another, another CUNY NYSEB alum. Um, yes, Shoshitil put En Comunidad is their book. It's wonderful. It takes up a translanguaging lens, particularly on literacy units. So this is really a great, um, a great mentor text for thinking about curriculum, particularly literacy curriculum. I hope that helped. Thank you for to Liz and Shoshitil for putting in the, the resources there. Okay, let me look over the Q&A, see if I missed anything. Perfect. Great. Yes, yeah, so I didn't say her co-writer's name, Luz Herrera, who was also, as I said, a, a member of the CUNY NYSEB project. Okay, a couple more minutes just to let people gather their thoughts, put them in the chat. And for those of you who are who are still thinking, or maybe you don't necessarily have a question now, um, of course, there's my email address, there's my Twitter handle. Um, more than welcome to message me. I love hearing from you, hearing about what you're doing with this work. Um, as a very final uh, piece of this reflection, I would like you to just put into the chat, um, if you're able, a word in any language, a phrase, couple of word phrase in any language that represents how you're feeling, what you're taking with you after this session. If you could put that in the chat and then we'll read them all together, that would be wonderful. And I'm going to put one too. Mm, affirmed, confirmed. Mm. Invigorated inspired, enlightened, wonderful. Language is fluid, love that. Interested, good, that's a good place to be. Affirmed, empowered, wonderful. Hmm, hopeful. I've seen so many takes on validated, right? Confirmed, affirmed, validated, empowered. And I think that speaks so much to the fact that so many of us have known that this is the right way to teach emergent bilinguals. But, you know, as Ophelia likes to say, we hope that this translanguaging work, our book, any of the work of CUNY NYSEB, enables you to say, this truth and voz alta, right? At, at the top of our lungs, 
not from behind a closed door. Um, and so that's what we hope this work does, is really provide you with a research base, a scholarly base for what you know to be true, right? What you have known to be true. So um, I'm so glad all of you were here this morning. Um, it has been such a pleasure to be here with you, to learn with you, to learn from you. I see Liz is sharing a Padlet with resources. How wonderful. Um, please click on that. Make sure to note it. Take a look at some of the resources that were provided um, in the PDF of this presentation, which you have access to. Um, and I'll stick around for a couple of minutes, but I just want to say thank you again. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you for being with me this morning and this afternoon. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Seltzer. Great job. Oh, thank you so much, Liz. I hope that was what you oh, had. Amazing. It was a great start to our convening. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, overwhelmed. This is, you know, when you're working on your dissertation, you're like, oh, my goodness, I wish this, you know, how great would it be to be able to organize an event? And so thankful for all of you for joining us. On, well, on well this congratulations. Endeavor. This seems like such a wonderful event. Um, and you're getting some some love in the chat there. I see. <laughs> um, you know, I know that these these are hard things to organize, and you did it. So congratulations yeah. to you. Yeah, I had a great team member, uh, Dr. Sulema Carrion, is usually just quiet in the back, but she's a powerful mentor. So I'm grateful to have just yeah. some amazing people at IDRA. Good. Uh, it's so we're able to do this. So thank you, you. Support this work. It's wonderful. Thank you. It was just so amazing to be able to offer it yes. uh, for free for so many of our educators and our administrators. So the, the more things we can offer folks without cost, you know, the the which is what I love about CUNY, right? Everything is just absolutely just accessible to everyone. Accessible, free, open to whoever wants to find it. So I hope you'll continue to share it. This uh, this Padlet is wonderful. Um, and I'll continue to add. Um, I don't know if I add your resources. The um, so I see, I see our book is here. I see your handouts. Can I oh, add sure. them? Or? Yeah, sure. You can add those for sure. Um, I think the only yeah you can do the um, the one that might be you know most useful oh. is the reflecting activity. Okay. I'll yeah, add that one. I think that would be the one that that if you were going to add one, that would be the best one to add. Thank you. If you have anything else, feel free to uh, share with me and I'll, I'll add it to that Padlet. Awesome. That sounds really good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Liz. I'll, I'll sign off now. Adios. Adios. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.